Hello, everyone, and welcome back to the Breakthrough Club. In case it's your first time, just like when I introduced myself, my name is Sergatas, founder and CEO of Flawless and Bounds. Breakthrough Club is about all about new ideas. We invite business leaders in the Canadian and the U.S. community who actually are rising above the noise by taking their organization and their community and thinking outside the box. And with great pleasure, I would love to introduce today Felix Bach, founder and CEO of Chop Value Micro Manufacturing. Felix, thank you for joining the show today. Thank you so much for having me and thanks for the nice introduction. Really appreciate it. And listen, the audience today want to learn a lot from you. So let's go slowly here. First, give us more about your background. Um, born, raised, education. Yeah, of course. Um, so uh, yeah, I'm, I'm the CEO of Chop Value Manufacturing and uh, it was quite a journey to come here because obviously when you grow up uh, as a young boy in the Alps in Germany, you don't dream of having a, a chopstick business that uh, recycles millions of chopsticks into new products. So uh, that's definitely not what I, what I had in mind when I was a little boy. Um, but I did always want to become a carpenter. So I'm a, I'm a traditional woodworker by trade, uh, left school very early to get into the trades. And um, after my um, you know, young career in the trades, I uh, went back to university to uh, become a wood engineer. And uh, from wood engineering, it took me all over the world in, in a very specific area of um, natural fiber composite materials, um, using bamboo as a fast growing material um, for the automotive industry, uh, among other industries. And um, this is how I ended up in Vancouver, where I live wow. today. Um, so our business is uh, headquartered in Vancouver, uh, British Columbia, Canada. Um, where I had the pleasure to do my PhD at UBC on structural bamboo products and um, figuring out that academia wasn't really my, uh, my pace. Um, I learned that uh, there's a lot of uh, waste that we have in our cities mm. that, um, you know, from a materials engineering perspective, I thought it would be a really uh, inspiring story to tell if we could uh, create a viable business simply by um, recycling chopsticks and turn them into new materials. That's amazing. And you know what, Felix, like you remind me, I just had a couple of weeks ago another interview with uh, Colin, founder and CEO of Recycle Smart. So they're also in the recycling business. Yeah. So it's just amazing. We, we can see from BC, a lot of uh, entrepreneurs are kind of really kind of trying to figure out and tackle the recycling business and tackle it in new ways that are not normal ways. So tell us more about uh, shop value. Uh, What's like for, for audience who maybe never, maybe never heard about job value before, what do you guys do? Which I assume is the majority because uh, we are still a fairly small business. Um, um, we are now three years in business and uh, um, you know, it, it really started as an inspiring project where I thought, um, uh, how do I, like, why am I so frustrated that, that uh, we have so much uh, construction waste from the, uh, from the rapidly changing housing market. Mm -hmm. So we start, I started in a much bigger industry um, noticing that there wasn't really a demand in, in, in using these recycled materials or, or demolished materials because I think we have a luxury problem in, in North America. Mm. We have uh, too much forest uh, that, that is much easier accessible than actually um, converting uh, wood waste into new materials. So out of that little bitterness, I, I, I thought, what if we just start with something small that is relatable, approachable, um, and I started with a little humble chopstick, right? And uh, it, it started as a little project, but after we got so much media exposure and so much traction on the market as well with the products we developed, um, you, you see in the background, uh, that is actually our very, very first product. I was going to ask you, it looks actually very beautiful, artistic, and I'm assuming recycled, so. Yeah, it is, yeah. It's, uh, yeah we, we always say, who thought you can um, put chopsticks on your wall? Um, <laughs> you know, eat it and uh, um, I think that's, that's where the business, business 101 kicks in. Uh, I don't have a business uh, degree and um, a product like this is beautiful, but it doesn't solve any problem um, for the customer other than uh, our early adopters that just want to be uh, involved in the sustainable home decor sector. But uh, the problem we solve is just, I think it's more thought leadership um, mm. uh, you know, vision with job value where uh, we kind of want to tell the story of if we can create a viable business recycling chopsticks, imagine how much underutilized resources we actually have in our urban environment. Mm. 
And um, mm. this is how we come up with the, with the term urban harvesting. Um, there are the recycling businesses out there. Uh, they, um, you know, they, they do urban harvesting for, for, for obviously decades to, uh, to transition our, um, our waste from, you know, um, residential and commercial waste. But I think the, the unique part, what we do is we actually create so much value to the end product that this, this typical hockey stick curve of growth in business that you're looking for, we actually experience that embedded in our production process. Interesting. So we're taking something that is worth nothing. Um, we define it as a new resource. And once we have done the processing um, locally as well uh, into new engineered materials, the value we create is, is so high that there's actually so much value propositions um, from that under resource to the end product that makes it really, really attractive from a business perspective. Interesting. And I know we you touched on, uh, you know, uh, the harvesting model and all those kind of things. I also noticed that you're, you're adding in your business process the concept of micro-manufacturing. Mm -hmm. uh, tell us more about that, just for the audience today as well. I, we, we had to come up with a term that describes what we do. And um, I, I knew um, the technology we developed is so unique and so um, uh, proprietary from from you know, using adhesives that are biodegradable from the automotive sector and all of a sudden you combine it with a crazy chopstick story. So I didn't want to, I didn't want to devalue ourselves by calling it just an, a specialized wood shop. Hmm. It's not hmm. as sexy as calling it micro factory, um, you know, tagging along with that very approachable um, business like a microbrewery where you can walk in and in full transparency, you know, behind glass, you actually you can see the whole thing happening. And this is creating the relationship with the community. The community, uh, you, our customers, they understand that uh, if, if, they're, if they're buying a tabletop or a cutting board, they understand that these chopsticks, they may have eaten with them, with their families. Wow, it's that's a, amazing. It's a cool story to tell. Yeah. Um, and after that first little wow moment is over, we can then go into the scientific explanation and say, and by the way, um, it's not only a feeble product. We like this should be simply the norm, and this is actually what circular economy is all about. Hmm. Um, and yeah, this is this is this is where the term micro manufacturing is coming from. Th thank you for explaining that, and I, and I like what you guys are doing because, in a way, you are one of the accelerator factors in kind of this new movement and actually kind of bringing it to life because everybody speaks about manufacturing, as you said before. There's a lot of manufacturing organizations that are kind of doing the right thing. But I, I think, Felix, you guys are really taking it to the next level because you're, uh, you're combining B2C in a way, but there's a B2B com business to business component then. There's a lot of uh, uh, creative and art, I can see that on the wall. And, and then at the same time, there's a layer of engineering and there's a layer of supply chain that you're actually combining in your business. So that's uh, very impressive. No, thank you so much for the for the nice feedback. I think what what I realized myself when I started a business is that um, my passion was material engineering, right? That's that's how the product was created. Mm -hmm. But <clears throat> um, throughout the process of, of of founding Chop Value, I learned about circ circular economy because it just because of running a business that is based on these values. I learned about people loving the um, resource efficiency thinking and. <clears throat> Every time um, people ask us, can you, can you do the same micro manufacturing model with this material or, or this material, or um, we're getting new ideas provided by our community on um, them looking now, like them walking through their cities with open eyes. And that's um, amazing. I think this is just the, the, uh, the realization that we have on thought leadership. Um, it, you know, it may start all with a little chopstick, but I hope many, many others will adopt the exact same resource efficient thinking um, uh, within our urban environments. You're, you're applying crowdsourcing with your clients and you're building a playbook that actually can take it from one industry and you can scale it to other industries. Like I can see the art of the possible here and sky's the limit really for, for what you guys are doing. I, I love that definition by um, that, that you just mentioned. It's 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 true. Um, sometimes you have to start very very simple to um, to tackle complex issues, 
and I don't think I would have had the resources or the um, uh, the market uh, validation if I would have started with 600,000 tons of wood waste because that's already a number that most of the consumers don't understand and can't develop an emotion for. Mm. But if I tell them, hey, did you know that we're throwing out 100,000 chopsticks every day? I can relate to that. Mm-hmm. I can actually relate to what you're saying right now. Yeah, yeah. because it's, 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 it's easier because you, at least now every time you go for your favorite Asian cuisine restaurant, you will not forget us. You will think about that crazy chopstick guy who, uh, who hired so far, you know, more than 25 people That's um, amazing. Uh, just by recycling chopsticks. <laughs> That's amazing. That's amazing. Now, t- so, so, so tell me more about the, uh, the team, uh, you know, the, 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 the caliber, the departments in the team. And I get it. 25 people. You guys are growing. I totally get that. Three and a half years, I'm assuming, in the business. Uh, yeah, we're three, three, three and a half years old. Yeah. Um, uh, currently going through a, a very small pandemic, I hear, right? Um, <laughs> um, but we, uh, we've built departments as we grew. Um, it all started with manufacturing and production, um, not, not counting the engineering efforts that went into the, the process because that came initially from me. Um, and then um, uh, my very first intern uh, actually became a founding partner in the business because wow. he has had so much skin in the game since day one. Um, so uh, he's still with us, uh, you know. That's amazing. In- incredible growth. Um, and uh, the two of us have tackled the engineering and the technology. Then uh, we hired our first production staff. And after year one, we were cash flow positive and we had a, a team of six people. And this is then the first time where we thought, hey, this, this might not only be a story, this might actually be a business. And mm. that's that's when we started structuring as a business and you know best right you you have to then think of uh product market fit um positioning um you cannot just make hexagon tiles anymore <laughs> you have to understand how to scale this if you want to keep on paying six people's salaries um and in year two um we were around 15 people and we had our first um uh, we, we actually called our marketing team the community building team at nice. first Um, because we knew um, the concept has to be scalable locally. Mm. Um, What I mean by that is when you, when you, when you define a product as made local, you often get that sense that it's made by that single person craftsmanship and you have to pay three times the price as uh, when you would walk into Ikea. And we want to kind of remove that feeling. We want to say we make our products industrial, but made local wherever you are in these micro factories. Um, and uh, you, you know, you get your commodity product at the same price, but only um, at the most sustainable, most local uh, carbon neutral way. So I'm, I'm helping the, I'm helping the, 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 you know, the, in the industry, mm-hmm. the, uh, the recycling aspect of things. I'm helping local businesses. Mm-hmm. You're building a, a community of local uh, builders of the community as well. That's your marketing engine as well. So you're kind of, you're trying to build a business model as a win-win-win situation for everyone, uh, not just one, one angle. Which That's is the ideal. Awesome. And, um, and if you make the effort to connect with the community, uh, you also um, can scale that effort and, and, and kind of translate that philosophy to the next city you're expanding to because you want your team in Montreal or Toronto where we, are, where we are based as well as in Los Angeles, you want them to think the same way that the core focus has to be how do I sell to my local community and what's my local product market fit. And obviously in the occasional scenarios, uh, if we get a big corporate order and um, we have all micro factories working together and only in that case we would ship product uh, in any other case we would try to keep um, the resourcing like the supply the manufacturing and the distribution local local that's amazing yeah. that's amazing and uh, so share with me from a high level perspective your playbook of opening a new market like I'm, I'm hearing from you that you know you build a community a community managers mm-hmm. uh, that, that build the community so that's one aspect do you also go and look for uh, local micro manufacturing or local people who actually will kind of forgive my, my, my ignorance, but like put the chipsticks together and pressure them. And uh, is that how you guys like start building the model? So that visualization that you just did, <laughs> um, that's obviously happening in, in, in developed machinery. 
um, you know, like these machines, um, that's not that's not handmade. That's uh, an, a process where, you know, millions of chopsticks get processed uh, every month wow. into a new highly densified material. But after that raw material is created, you're right, there are um, our fine woodworkers, makers, uh, carpenters who then use that new raw material and create new products out of it. Hmm. So um, that's a beautiful thing of the relationship of the production team. They see the, the resource coming in from their own team members. That resource gets created into a new material and that material gets then created through the end product. It goes all the way through so that you can control your efficiency and you can um, monitor your process um, so that you understand the value that you create as a business. Um, so walking you through the, the, the concept of opening your own micro factory, um, it's pretty much like opening a, a Starbucks coffee or a, a Subway restaurant, only that it's um, part of the circle economy. And uh, it's a bit more sexy because you're, you're, you're part of a movement. Um, so you can, you can really think of it as, as a manufacturing franchise. Um, you're, you're, you're receiving the technology, the training, the support, um, and uh, all sales and marketing materials you need to enter your local market. Beautiful. And if I understand correctly, uh, Felix, you said, so you guys are operating, you started from Vancouver, you have now operation in Montreal uh, and, and Los Angeles. What's, what's the next uh, city in mind? Well, that, that is strongly now dependent on uh, the interest we create um, where uh, I feel like the silver lining of this pandemic um, uh, that we haven't really mentioned yet is, is we don't have to try hard anymore hmm. explaining people how important it is to keep supply chains local. Um, right now, we are, we are really building attraction where people understand that the more we can uh, produce local and distribute local, the less we are dependent on um, you know, trade relationships, uh, overseas travel, Correct. Um, supply shortages. And um, this is where we have really have been taken off. So uh, the next city is really um, uh, depending where the traction is, depending on who we're interested in, because um, the only reason why we, from a leadership team perspective, uh, decided to go into franchising is we are running out of capacity to manage locations ourselves. Hmm. And on top of that, we want to make sure that uh, uh, cities uh, with, with passionate people who want to run micro factories um, can actually, you know, they know their city best. Like why should right. I, why, why should I it, uh, tell people in New York how to run their micro factory if they know their community and their opportunities best? So you want to give them that freedom to build their own market and um, while providing them the tools uh, necessary to be successful. Got it. So, so then your platform right now enables new entrepreneurs who, who want to do something, who want to run something, they want to be, uh, join this movement of recycling. They don't need to start from scratch. You guys already have proven your model. You have a playbook. When they join you as franchisee uh, operators, then they apply those playbooks that you guys have been building for the last three years. Now, tell me more about the end user. Right, so like the client, the c customer who eventually will work with you directly or with your franchisee operator. Like, how do you guys come with the idea? Uh, how they know about you? Uh, yeah. What kind of model of sales and marketing guys are applying right now? Yeah, I think um, this is where we experienced the strongest growth over the last year, uh, where we really moved from a, a manufacturing organization um, to a sales organization. Um, yes. I, I, I always had that hesitation to, um, uh, to really have that uh, traditional sales department. You know, I just shared with you that we started with community builders that, we, that were pretty much our marketers because that was the strength we wanted to develop first, the awareness. Um, but now with, with the right fit of, of people in our sales team, uh, what we do is we, we try to look for values aligned and cultural aligned customers. Um, culture aligned would be easy uh, if every single Asian cuisine restaurant or a mall who, um, who produces waste with, with chopsticks. Um, that's the cultural alignment. Um, and then uh, the value alignment is uh, who really buys into our why of the company. Mm -hmm. So um, do I care about sustainability? Do, do 
I care about waste conversion or recycling? And do I care? Do I understand what circular economy is all about? Um, so if we find a customer that is value and culture aligned, then we have a really, really good chance to work together. Absolutely. And I'm, I'm just writing the points here because this is actually very, this is great point for any business leader, any leader, regardless in business or in community to build your community and attract the right talent to take your company to the next level or take your franchise operations to the next level. You mentioned cultural alignment, you mentioned value alignment, which is, I clearly get the, the difference between both of them. It makes perfect sense. And I like what you said about the value alignment. You start with the why first, uh, then, then you go from there. So that's... Uh, Makes sense. And your why is clear, sustainability. Yeah, you're right. And being part of the bigger so. Absolutely. And, um, and what we learned, um, and I can only recommend that to any other uh, younger business, because uh, in, in my first year in business, um, you know, you're going through a lot of advice and a lot of accelerators that really want to help you. And I don't think you have a tangible understanding of how important your why actually is. Mm. And this is why now three and a half years in business, we actually reviewed um, why did customers buy from us over the last three years. Hmm. And if you actually then uh, write down very, very honest the, 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 the reasons why these customers bought from you, you will get to know your why. Hmm. And our why is really, um, I think on number two is sustainability. Hmm. On number one, I really think it's the story. And what the story really means for us is thought leadership. You know, it's, it's, it's that feeling or that emotion our customers have. If, if, if they can do it with chopsticks, we can do better as a society. 100%. Absolutely. Absolutely. And you know what? We need those kind of stories, and especially right now. But we need to remember we, we are human beings. We're living on this planet. And you know what? COVID is just a reminder yeah. that we need to go back to our basics and understand the value and appreciate everything around us. Yeah. So to, that's amazing. To, to us, um, you know, moving from client to internal team members, uh, the best team members we have hired so far were the ones that, that care so much about the environment that they have that negative um, association to business and making a career. Mm -hmm. And I love those team members um, because in the interview already, I will notice that behavior and then I will tell them uh, at Job Value, you will learn why we feel so good building a business and why we feel so good that we like we obviously want to make money we want to we i have a high career ambition but i want to make sure that scientifically scientifically proven we create social impact environmental impact um with the business that we grow um and this is why we can attract these team members who then really can you know apply their uh, sustainability mission to uh, to to what it means to grow a, a good business that's amazing. That's amazing. And I think this is where you start attracting rock stars and really kind of the business will see more of those yeah. hockey sticks to take it to the next level. Yeah. And we honestly, this is like the one thing, especially over the last two months, you know, March and April is probably for every small business owner um, a challenge. And I hope you're doing well. Um, but, you know, the, the team is really what gets me up in the morning. Uh, like I really like when I wake up in the morning, I know I have to get up for my team. Um, because they are absolutely rock stars. That's, that's the one and only reason. That's beautiful. And that's, that's leadership in itself. So uh, I, I'm, I'm sure I'm hearing this from you. That's, uh, that's actually amazing. So Felix, final question. Uh, and you, you, touched, you touched a little bit on culture. And this is critical as well in how you manage the team. Are all the team right now locally in Vancouver or do you have some team members remote? Uh, how, how does that work for you guys? Um, so... Uh, we, we have remote team members. Um, the core team is based in Vancouver. Um, that we, we found that to be very successful to have at a very young business, a lot of time together of course. Uh, to grow company values together so that it doesn't all come from me. Um, and uh, uh, right now uh, with you know, working from home um, uh, and, and probably the tendency is that this will be um, transition to a majority of their time uh, working from home um, we we have just had the advantage that we all got to know each other in person already um, we had a lot of face time together and uh, even today um, we have the chance that if we have important meetings or for example performance reviews with each other that we can do that in person on a walk outside um, and that's obviously the the luxury we have living in a city like vancouver 
That's amazing. Uh, Felix Block, uh, founder and CEO of Chubb Valley. Thank you so much for your time today. My final question to you is, what's the takeaway for the audience today? Uh, what's kind of one or two advice you want to leave them with to reflect on? Um, I, think, I think the cliche message that I usually have is uh, size doesn't matter if you want to lead to change. Um, even even the, the little chops they can can kind of teach us, teach us a lesson on resource efficiency. And, um, and secondly is that um, even though you're very, very career ambitious and business ambitious, um, it, the, the more true uh, you stay to yourself and your your core values, um, the better it will work out uh, from a business perspective. Felix, I wish you all the best. Uh, you're an amazing leader, great ideas, and I'm, I'm, I learned a lot from you today, and I'm sure the audience will learn a lot too. For, for them to engage with your organization, how they can, how they can find you? Uh, they can find us online um, uh, on chopvalue.com um, or in all social media channels uh, to check out our latest work. And I'll make sure the Flawless and Bound team follow your company as well. Thanks again for your time and enjoy the rest of your day. Thank you for the conversation.